September 2018 edition, um, looking at a model of inpatient geriatric consultation service. I don't have any conflict of interest to disclose. The Cochrane Review, looking um, at comprehensive geriatric assessment for older adults, included 29 randomized controlled trials and looked at a population of 65 years and older admitted to acute care hospital or to inpatient rehabilitation after an acute care hospitalization. We looked at several outcomes and reported that there was high quality evidence that older adults, if they received a CGA during hospital stay, were more likely to be alive and in their home at three to 12 months of follow-up and less likely to be admitted to a nursing home at three to 12 months of follow-up. They also looked at uh, other outcomes and reported that there was high quality evidence that there was little or no difference in mortality or dependence and length of stay varied. They also did a cost effectiveness analysis to compare the cost and the outcomes between the two groups. Um, for the cost, since it was UK-based review, they used the NHS system, calculated the cost in British pounds, and included the cost of hospitalization and conducting a CGA by a geriatrician. The health outcomes they looked were qualities, life years, and life years lived at home. Life years lived at home is a measure that they calculated by dividing the number of days at home after discharge by the duration of the study. And so they concluded that the cost effectiveness was unclear due to heterogeneity and inconsistencies in data. However, there was slight increase in qualities with risk ratio of 0 0.012 at GBP of 19,000 per quality gained slight increase in life years at this ratio of 0 0.037 at GBP of 6,000 for life year gained and slight increase in life years with their home, this ratio of 0 0.019 at GBP of 12,000 for life years gained, life years with their home gain. CGA was delivered um, in these RCTs by interprofessional team, which composed of a geriatrician and a mix of allied health services delivered on a specialist geriatric ward or across several wards by a mobile team, and this was compared with the usual hospital care by the ward team. Application of this model is challenging due to lack of resources needed for investment in interprofessional teams in addition to the ward-based allied health services. And I, I would say that it is more challenging in um, community um, hospitals, um, um, even more challenging in community hospitals. So this made me think, is there a model that is less resource intensive with comparable outcomes? This is a pre and post intervention design comparing patients who received the geriatric consultation to propensity matched historical control admitted before development of the consultation service at the same hospital. Inclusion criteria was, were at older adults 70 years or older admitted to departments of medicine and trauma at the tertiary care academic center in the USA between 2013 and 2017. They excluded patients with length of stay of less than one day, daily charges of more than 50,000, or total charges of more than 150,000, or encounters missing the discharge date. Intervention was an inpatient geriatric consultation that utilized ward uh, or unit based allied health services. The geriatric team included a geriatrician and a physician assistant. Control was propensity matched historical control who did not receive an inpatient geriatric consultation. They looked at several outcomes, including mortality, discharge to home, and patient length of stay, ICU days, holy days for 100 patient days, medication doses for 100 patient days, 30 day readmissions, physician orders for life sustaining treatment, restraint orders, advanced directives, daily charges, and total charges. So, the consultation team, which included a geriatrician and physician assistant, was introduced at medicine residence orientation grounds. Advertisements were placed in team rooms, and people were encouraged to, um, to refer for geriatric syndromes. Consultation request and implementation of the recommendations was at the discretion of the primary team. The team took part in clinical care and system level improvement. For clinical care, they held daily meetings um, with the allied health services on the wards. So they participated in daily ward rounds, as well as weekly rounds with the allied health services to um, follow the progress of patients through the hospitalization for patients who were already being consulted. And also um, they were at that point referred patients who the team felt would benefit from a consultation. They also attended uh, real-time bedside rounds and follow-up discussions with them with the MRP. Targeted recommendations often included medication adjustments, reducing physical restraints, pain control, preventing and treating delay, and much planning and advanced care planning. 
Our system level improvement the LEAs with informatics, pharmacy, nursing, leadership, and trauma surgical intensive care unit. There was redesign of admission order sets, development of symptom specific order sets, and championing advanced care planning and thoughtful prescribing. They used the propensity scores and stratified matching to compare the cases and controls. And this is a list of all the variables they used for their propensity score model. Overall, I would say that the cases and controls were generally well balanced, except that cases were more likely to be female and receive a functional assessment and have a lower level of function. Total of 16,000 encounters were analyzed. Of these, approximately 3,000 were excluded. Then from 7,219 encounters in the pre-intervention period to approximately 6,844 encounters in the post-intervention period, a final sample was drawn, which included 464 individuals who received the intervention from post-intervention period and 2,381 matched controls who did not receive the intervention. We looked at several results, um, but uh, I would say they excluded several important ones which have commonly been reported in the RCTs on this topic. So they reported a significantly decreased hospital mortality to 0.4% versus 4%. Confidence interval was not given. This result was statistically significant. However, when you compare it with the RCT results, there is a huge difference. And uh, um, um, so, so, so that is, I would say, quite unusual. In terms of charges, they reported that the cost of the team was the salary of the geriatrician and the physician assistant. Um, and the total charges, they said, were $611 lower for individuals who received the consultation. Global mean charges per day, 8,348. The total charges were not different. They did not report a cost effectiveness analysis. They also reported that restraint orders um, were decreased 20% versus 27.9%, increasing physician orders for life-sustaining treatment. That's what POLST stands for. 58.2 versus 44.6%, 44 discharge to home, 33.4 versus 28.2%, 0 0.4 fewer days in the ICU compared with controls, 4.3 fewer days, fully catheter days per 100 patient days, 10.3 fewer doses of antipsychotics per 100 patient days, 5.3 fewer doses of benzodiazepines per 100 patient days and 7.1 fewer doses of antibiotics per 100 patient days. Critical appraisal. So this um, research design of pre and post using historical control is not appropriate for answering this type of study question as it is in, um, inherently prone to several threats to internal validity, for example, which occurs when, um, when there are processes that take place um, outside of the intervention that could affect the outcomes. And greater the time period between pre and post, greater the history threat. They could have taken some measures to decrease this, for example, by comparing the statistics across other sites um, and comparing their outcomes to see if there was a comparable change. They could also have used a concurrent control instead of a historical control group. There's also a high likelihood of regression to the mean threat because they did a measurement at a single point and the, they could have mitigated this by doing several measurements over a period of time. I feel that there is data dredging because instead of clearly, um, clearly stating a hypothesis and, um, and their primary and secondary outcomes, it bears to me that they kept on digging until they found some positive um, outcomes and reported all of them. They did not report many of the important outcomes previously reported in our CTs on inpatient geriatric consultation, for example, change in cognition, number of patients staying at home and alive, um, number of patients institutionalized, dependence, function, self-reported health, and cost effectiveness analysis. The effect size is quite large, um, but not sure if I would I believe that. Um, no confidence intervals were given. The outcome measurement methods were not reported and assessors were not blinded. Um, a few strengths, I would say, the study tried to address a clearly focused question um, if inpatient geriatric consultation by this model improved outcomes. Control group was used, although this was a historical control. Before and after measurement methods were constant. Objective outcome criteria were used for outcomes that they chose to report and the groups were relatively comparable. Will I use these results to my practice? I will be hesitant to apply the results, but the concept of utilizing ward-based interprofessional team is worth the consideration for future studies. The bottom line is that despite its several flaws, this study to, draws our attention, especially drew my attention to a model, which is less resource intensive and is uh, commonly used across Ontario hospitals. So closer collaboration between the geri geriatric 
clinician and ward-based allied health services. And dissemination of geriatric education and training to such teams might be a solution to the challenge. Comparability of this model in terms of important health outcomes and cost effectiveness needs to be further tested. Thank you. Thank you, Yumna. That's a very interesting um, presentation. And we'll open it up to questions now um, shortly. Thank you. And we're going to move on to Evelyn's presentation. And hopefully people are seeing her slides. And um, uh, Evelyn, I just wanted to let you know we're going to have to end just a couple of minutes before 9 because another group is using our line or the line. Uh, okay. so, so take it away. OK, so I'm Evelyn. I'm going to talk about a paper in July. It's MIMO Plus. Um, it's examining the cognitive training and psychological intervention in patients with MCI. So I have no conflict of interest to this close. So the objective of this talk was to review um, the current literature on cognitive training in MCI and to talk about this uh, RCT. So the theory behind um, cognitive training is that, so currently there's no effective pharmacological intervention um, in MCI. However, cognitive training has been associated uh, in previous studies in animal models to show the increased activation in hippocampus the, and all the other um, different lobes in our brain and maybe in other processes. And the secondary, um, the secondary goal uh, in doing these studies would be if they can identify cognitive interventions the effect in MCI, then they may in turn be able to target the neural network pathway that has the big, biggest um, specificity in MCI, and maybe they can prevent the progression from MCI to dementia. So there was a recent, uh, not recent, in 2017, there was a meta-analysis um, analyzing all the uh, RCT in cognitive training and MCI just a few months before this RCT was published. So the goal of this meta-analysis was to examine the, the efficacy of cognitive intervention in individuals diagnosed with MCI. So they, there were 26 studies that were included. They have to all be patients with MCI according to the research uh, definition, which is 1.5 standard deviation below their um, adjusted age and education. Um, they have to be RCT in an outpatient setting. Um, they compared cost of training to controls, either it's an active control or passive control, and all the outcome has to be based on neuropsychological measures. Um, and lastly, the kind of cost of training they use, they didn't very, uh, they didn't really spe specify it. It can either be like a compensatory type or like a restorative, restorative form of um, training. So this this meta analysis found that there was when you use multi component training and multi domain training, there is a moderate effect on the neuropsychological outcome. And what they mean by multi component form is that um, as long as they come combine different type of cognitive trainings, cognitive approaches, um, trying to target different parts of the brain. Um, and multi-domain means that they um, included things like lifestyle and socialization, so not just cognitive training. There was no, uh, there was insufficient evidence to uh, offer greater clarification to the effects of cognitive domain or the specific type of training. Um, and lastly, uh, they concluded that duration of intervention, which was the number of hours, had little, little influence on the mental outcome, but they didn't really specify um, what are the range of the, uh, the, the hours. And as far as I can tell is that um, it's either the short ones they, they describe as being eight weeks or less, which is around 46% of all the studies, and longer duration is greater than eight weeks, which was 54% of the studies. But the maximum duration was four months, so not a huge variation there. Um, and then they concluded from this MC, uh, sorry, not MCF, yeah, from this meta-analysis that they hypothesized that because cognitive intervention works because they may prompt recruitment of alternate neural processes as well as support the primary network so people can meet the task demand. Um, and lastly, the, in this uh, meta-analysis, well, one, a few um, weaknesses said, the overall test, they find that the overall testing, sorry, the overall comparison period of follow-up assessment after 
they completed the training was not significant. However, the majority of studies completed the post-training evaluation within two weeks or less. So again, it's like 80% of the study uh, did the study, did the analysis after two weeks. So again, this is not a lot of variation in terms for their analysis. Um, and then this meta-analysis, most of the studies were like had small sample sizes, um, different, the very, very interventions were really heterogeneous, and then the site, and the, there was moderate publication bias in, um, in the studies included. So this group of author who published the Nemo Plus, which is actually based at Quebec, they felt that previous study lack active control group, so oftentimes um, it's not actively recruited, the patients in the control group. And then they also, uh, the previous study lack information on whether the learned strategies could be transferred to real life. So their aim is to use the MIMO study, which is a, um, I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but it's like a cognitive training study developed in Quebec. Um, and it focuses on learning new strategies with the goal to optimize encoding and retrieval, so mostly in the memory domain. And their goal uh, was to, using the MIMO study to determine if it helped uh, patient, uh, persons with amnestic MCI in their um, cognitive functioning. Uh, to determine whether a psychosocial intervention to, can improve the psychological health of in individuals with amnestic MCI. And the reason why they included that as one of their goals is because recent, there's some recent interest in the potential interventions that target non cognitive symptoms, which namely are anxiety and depression um, in patients with cognitive impairment. And lastly, they wanted to examine moderators of the effect of cognitive training. What they mean by moderators is that is there anything intrinsic to the person um, that's going to predict whether they're going to benefit more or less from cognitive training. So the peak of the study, so the population are the older, which is like greater than 65 years old. They're all French speaking because this cognitive training program is based in French. Um, they have corrected uh, normal vision and hearing, and they need to meet the criteria of amnestic MCI. So they used the research uh, definition where um, they scored at least 1.5 standard, standard deviation below the average level of same age peers. And they also have to have a memory complaint and an objective memory deficit. Um, in terms of their intervention, so there are two arms of intervention. One is the MIMO group where they did the cognitive training. And then the other one is a psychological intervention group that we'll talk a little bit more about. And the control is a no contact uh, control group. Outcomes, they have um, quite a number of outcomes. So they divide it into three categories. One is a change in memory measure where they measure both immediate and delayed uh, episodic uh, score, uh, which they use a word list and face name association task. And then in terms of their psychological health measures, they uh, use the GAS, uh, GDS, and the general well-being schedule. And the last thing they measured is whether they could generalize these gains to everyday life. Um, so they use something called the multifactorial memory questionnaire, um, which is something they measure how frequently participants use memory strategies in their daily life. Um, and then they also look at what there's a um, scoring system called the activity of daily living prevention instrument questionnaire, which is measuring how much difficulties people have performing their activities daily living. And the last thing is just a general question um, about their subjective feeling of like how much memory complaint they have. And the setting is two sites in Quebec. Um, I believe they're both teaching hospital there. They excluded, um, they excluded the criteria basically anyone with like an active psychiatric disorder, um, they have like substance abuse and they cannot have um, dementia, which is kind of the inclusion criteria where they need to have MCI. And participants were recruited from the two memory clinic in uh, Quebec uh, at those two sites where I listed before. And in terms of their randomization, they actually had a third a statistician who was not involved um, in in the project and then the statistician 
performed the randomization, which was uh, centralized, and then they centralized every 12 to, sorry, they, they randomized every 12 to 15 participants into a site. And then this, 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 this statistician was not involved in subsequent um, analyses. Um, so they included, uh, initially they consented 153, and then um, after reading the inclusion exclusion criteria, there was 145. So they, what they did is that, so there was a um, pre-training where they did not provide any cognitive training, psychological intervention. They just talked about what was going to happen and depend on which arm you're randomized to, if you were randomized into the cognitive training arm, you're going to um, get training over a two month period in terms of um, the MIMO study, uh, sorry, the MIMO cognitive training itself. And then um, approximately, and then in, uh, sorry, after the tr uh, training, you're going to have immediately a test, which is the post test. Um, and then after three months, you're going to have another test and then you have the same results. After the three month period, they um, offer, offer a booster session, which is approximately one week. And after the booster session, and three months after, you, they get the same test again. So it's identical in the other arms, including the psychological arm, but then they, the booster session would be about their psychological intervention. And then in a no contact arm, or they get this that um, they get randomized, and then after two months, other people completed their training, they get the test, and then after three months, they get a test, and after six months, they get another test. But after they completed the entire study, um, both the psychological arm and the no contact arm got like some intensive cult of training that is not really from the MIMO. And in terms of their anal uh, statistical analyses, so um, they, it's an intention to treat uh, analysis and they use uh, the mixed linear model to look at the scores of the um, memory test, the psychological test and how they scored on the um, uh, general performance test. Um, so they look at the intervention by time interaction, which when there's an interaction, it means that when there, sorry, if there's an interaction between the intervention and time, it means that the intervention is more, uh, is doing something, but it doesn't say if it is um, giving a better result or a worse result. So if there is a intervention time interaction, they would move on to look at their efficacy. So the way to define efficacy is that they would look at the change in their pre-score and post-score. Um, and if it is significant and they would, and it's better, then they would conclude that the intervention is, uh, is doing something compared to the no contact arm. And lastly, they um, use the stepwise regression analyses to look at any moderators that is going to um, uh, predict if there's any moderator that would predict like a greater changes in their memory score at three at the three time points. So this is a brief um, summary of like what the MIMO plus um, entails. But the main thing is that they they provide attention training because that's the one of the hypotheses that they need to uh, people with MCI has like shorter attention span. So they train their attention um, and they teach them skills and how to um, remember things long term. And then there's the psychological intervention arm. Um, and this program, again, is eight sections. Um, the content of the psychological intervention was based on CBT, the cognitive behavioral approach. And the aim for this approach is to improve general psychological well being of the um, participants. So here's the table one. Uh, so the characteristics. Uh, so their group is like pretty similar in terms of their age and their 70s. Um, female, male, relative, roughly half and half. Um, they're all quite educated. Um, they have like over 14 years of education and that's their baseline MOCA score. So in terms of the memory composite score, it is, um, they, they normalize, sorry, they use like, they reported the set score. So that's why it's like 0, 0.0 something. So they're, they all performed 
pretty equally prior to the training. Um, and as I mentioned, so the two memory tests, because they're going to use that as the result. So it's remembering a word list and remembering face, face name association. So there are four tasks in total. So they're going to show you 12 frequent and imaginable words um, on a piece of paper. And all of them are presented simultaneously and the participant has two minutes to try to remember it. And after the two minutes, they take away the paper and ask the participant to recall what are the words. So kind of like the CRA test. And then after 10 minutes, they would ask them again, what were the words? So after this first test, then they would show them another set of words and then they repeat it and then another set of words and they repeat it. And then after they completed that three sets of words, they would give them um, uh, a series of face name association. So a face and what the name is. So they present it one by one. Um, and each association was presented for 45 seconds. They have 45 seconds to remember. And then afterwards, they presented all of them. They would ask them to recall what were their face name associated with show them a face and ask them what's the name. And then after 10 minutes, they're going to ask them again. So all these scores were compiled into a set score that was reported. Uh, we're all familiar with the GDS. So uh, 15 is the maximum score and 15 means you're very depressed. GAS in this case is 20 was the maximum score. So if they score 20, they're quite anxious. So in this group of patients, they're relatively um, not depressed and anxious. And the last one is the general well being schedule. I don't think we use it too much. So the maximum score was um, 105 um, and 72. It's um, kind of less, uh, they reported they feel less well in general. Um, and then the last outcomes that they measured is like how well they apply these strategies um, in their daily living. So the strategy score, which is measured through the meta -mem memory questionnaire, the max score is. Um, 96. Um, and then, uh, so the higher score, which means, which means they are applying more. Uh, and then the ADL uh, question, which is the Activities of Daily Living Prevention Instrument, the maximum score is 45. So the higher score they have, which means they have less difficulty. Um, and then the last question is subjective memory complaints. So it, literally, they show them one question and ask them, how, how do you feel? your memory is. So the lower the score is means they have less memory complaint. So here comes the result. Um, so the first result they wanted to look at is the memory score. So um, in the immediate memory composite score, they actually did not find an intervention by time interaction, which means that um, intervention by itself is not better than no contact group, even though if you see that um, the score seems to be higher. Um, and then in the delayed memory composite score, they actually found a interaction between the intervention and time, which means that it supports that a training effect is present and it's not just by the effect of um, time. And then there's a significant difference uh, found in the pre and post scores um, in the cognitive training group, um, but not in the psychologic, psychological group in the delayed memory composite score. So what it means is that um, this test seems to be helpful in the delayed memory composite score. Um, and then the second type of results they're looking at is like their psychological outcome. So in none of the depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, or well-being um, measures, uh, none of them show the intervention by time interaction, which means neither the cost of training or psychological intervention provided um, any benefit that is more than just time itself would provide. Um, but interestingly, they found that uh, men seems to be um, more anxious and depressed in these groups. And then the last one is that they wanted to look at um, if these outcomes can be generalized to um, daily living. So in terms of whether people are used, the participants are using their strategies. So the first one was the MMQ, the Meta Memory Questionnaire. So they found that there was a intervention by time interaction for um, showing that going through the training itself um, seems to be benefit in utilizing these strategies. And it was found in the cognitive training group. 
um, there was no training effect found in uh, whether they found ADL difficulties, but it seems like even in the no contact group, it wasn't really changing that much. And the last one is um, the self-reported memory where they subjectively feel that if there is um, uh, any change in the memory difficulty. Um, so there is no interaction, intervention by time interaction. So again, the intervention itself did not provide any significant change. Um, but then over time, regardless of which group you're in, it seems like they have, um, they found that it was significant that uh, there was a reduced level of complaint, um, even in the no contact group. And then lastly, in the moderators um, study where they were trying to figure out if um, anything intrinsic to the participant is going to predict a better benefit. So they look at age, education, sex. Um, they also looked at like their personality. So they went to like a detailed personality test. Um, they look at how, uh, how likely they're going to stick to a routine, which they use like a, there is a, um, there is a questionnaire called like something routinization, and then they look at um, how the, in terms of their personality, how likely they are going to uh, uh, solve problems by themselves, which is called self-efficacy. So they found participants who like routine, who like to stick to a routine, and who have initiative to solve problems on their own, which is their self-efficacy. In these sort of uh, people with this type of personality, they were associated with a larger uh, delayed memory change score. And it's like they benefit more as they increase, not decrease. So uh, in terms of this uh, study itself, so it is a randomized study, it's placebo controlled, and there's definitely concealment of allocation. In terms of blinding, um, they could not blind the participants, but the um, uh, statisticians and the clinicians were blinded. Uh, the groups were fairly well balanced, even though it was randomized control study, they still did, a, um, uh, they still tested if the group were balanced and it was yes. And it was an intention to treat analyses. In terms of follow-up, um, there was 88% follow-up, but in terms of, um, but they included anyone who had completed the entire training, even if they only uh, participated in one post test, they still included in the analysis. So the ones who were actually followed through for all, uh, all three time points of the post-test was actually in this is 70 something percent. So in terms of the strengths of the study, um, so I thought one thing that really I haven't seen in previous studies that they, they see if it was actually transferable um, to their daily living, uh, which again is a questionnaire itself. Uh, but participants are still able to describe if they find it useful and if they're utilizing it every day. Um, and I did find that uh, is usually yes, even uh, when I ask my patients who are perform participating in the uh, learning the rope study, they usually say yes. Um, and it is a Canadian study. In terms of limitations, um, I still find even though um, it was a longer post assessment, which was six months, it was still kind of short because we know that we usually quote 10% of conversion from amnestic MCI to uh, dementia. So even though it is longer than what the average in the meta-analyses quoted, which was eight weeks, it's still relatively short. Um, if the author themselves felt that if they increased the amount of the, uh, if they provided more training in the psychosocial intervention. So what they mean is that if they provided longer interventions instead of just eight weeks, like two months, they might be able to find a um, difference. But I felt that patient in general scored pretty low in the GAS and GDS at baseline. So as a result, it might not be a suitable population to be studying uh, if the psychological intervention worked. So the question remaining to be said, um, this study still didn't answer the question if cognitive training decreased the yearly progression from amnestic MCI to AD. And the other one I would add is that the psycholo I think they were, what they were trying to target is the psychological intervention for patients with likely what they meant MBI or like with real anxiety and depressive symptoms. So it really still didn't answer it because the population weren't uh, scoring high in the GDS or GAS at baseline. 
But what we can conclude is that um, cognitive training as an approach to help um, older adults who are called vulnerable in the MCI group, um, it can possibly prevent dementia at, in at risk individuals at six months because their score was higher. Um, and psychological intervention had no effect on cognition in those with only amnestic MCI, but not in uh, without anxiety, anxiety or depression. Okay, thank you. Very good, Evelyn. Are there questions?